Okay. So, um, like I said, I'm going to start. So when I was going through the textbook, I figured since um, that's our supposed to be our main source of information, um, we should know the lab values from there. Also, because like the questions that we get assigned, like on our homework assignments and whatnot, um, also is through the values that they have. So I just wanted to go over those that way, like we all have them, but I didn't see many questions from the practice questions asking too many about them, but I think, I think it's good that we still all have like the same values. Um, so from the textbooks, thanks to Caroline for this, because uh, she was digging through um, finding these, but um, the urine specific gravity, according to the textbook is 1.005 to 1.030. Um, my, the hematocrit should be like 42 to 52% for men and then 35 to 47% for females. Um, hemoglobin is usually like 14 to 18 to men and 12 to 16 for females. The BUN is 10 to 20. Sodium 135 to 145. I've never seen that value change, so that's good. Um, potassium, 3.5 to 5. Um, I saw two different values in the textbook. For calcium, I saw 8.8 um, .8 to 10.4 in one of their charts, but I also saw um, 8.6 to 10.2 while doing course point questions. So I put both of them there, but anytime I've seen them ask a question about calcium, it would always be like seven or 12, like something where you know it's either lower or um, higher than that value. Um, phosphorus, I have 2.7 to four. For magnesium, I have 1.8 to 2.6. And for chloride, I have 97 to 107. Those are the lab values from the textbook. So those are the ones that, um, I think I'm going to use as my reference because um, it's from our book and our slides are supposed to be from our book. So um, those are the ones that I'm going to focus on. And if you didn't have these, this is what they are. Um, okay. So the official first question from her outline is um, defining the pathophysiology of acid-base imbalances and identifying the result of the disease that causes the imbalance. So when I was like looking at this particular question, I actually had a chart that I made from Dr. Habib's class, which really did um, help me when it came to studying. But before I get into um, the chart, I wanna talk about some of the things that Dr. Remy mentioned. Um, so Dr. Remy was talking about specifically um, respiratory acidosis scenarios. She was talking a lot about how when we have respiratory acidosis, a typical nursing diagnosis would be impaired gas exchange. And then she was providing us with different examples such as COPD, pneumonia, and overdosing on opioids. And the reason those all make sense is because respiratory acidosis is caused from hypoventilation or a slowed respiratory rate, right? They're not breathing as quickly as they should be. So as a result, they have a pH of less than 7.35 and a PaCO2 greater than 45, which means that because of their slow breathing, they are retaining more CO2 than they are letting out. That's why it makes sense, right? COPD, they retain a lot of CO2. And pneumonia, because they're not breathing properly, they retain a lot of CO2. Overdosing on drugs such as opioids caused respiratory depression, meaning slowed respirations. So we also have respiratory acidosis. And I was also noticing on course point, they actually ask questions like this. They ask if a patient has emphysema, right? Right 
um, what sort of acid base imbalance would you expect? And it was the answer was respiratory acidosis. So you could typically like assume for respiratory acidosis, you're talking about respiratory problems or people who have um, respiratory or chronic, let me say chronic respiratory conditions that are causing them um, to have a slowed respiratory rate, right? So um, definitely, I think that could also help you um, when thinking about what examples would I see respiratory acidosis in. And Similarly, for respiratory alkalosis, right, we're talking about someone who has hyperventilation, someone who's breathing really rapidly. And for me, the first thing that came to my mind was anxiety, because when you are anxious, um, typically you breathe a lot faster because you're anxious and you're nervous. And that would result in the pH being above 7.45 and that CO2 being less than 35. So we don't have as much CO2 as in our blood um, that we actually need because um, even though CO2 is bad, if it accumulates, we also need a certain amount of it. Um, so that was an example that I was thinking of if there were a question on the exam and I'm thinking about what would be a situation in which someone is hyperventilating. I was thinking anxiety or I was thinking, let's just say, um, you know, maybe someone who is fighting a ventilator, right? And um, that the sedation is not really working. They may start to breathe heavily because they can't really breathe at all. Um, so those are just some situations um, that I was thinking about, but for both of them, for respiratory, the cause is either hypoventilation or hyperventilation. So hypo, we're talking about respiratory acidosis. And for hyperventilation, we're talking about respiratory alkalosis. Um, for metabolic, it's a little different. So metabolic acidosis, always think renal. So a renal problem. If there's a kidney failure or a kidney injury, also can be called renal or renal failure or renal injury, those are typical examples of a metabolic acidosis, which means that the pH is less than 7.35 and the bicarbonate is less than 22 because metabolic is always the same thing happens. So if the pH goes down, the bicarbonate goes down, whereas we saw with respiratory, it was the opposite. If the pH went down, the CO2 would go up. And as a result of any metabolic um, issue, whether it's acidosis or alkaline, right, or alkalosis, I noticed that the result has to do with a potassium imbalance. So if you have metabolic acidosis and they're in renal failure, if that's the cause of renal injury, the result is going to be hyperkalemia or high potassium levels of greater than five. Whereas with metabolic alkalosis, the result is actually hypo and why that makes sense is because typically you see metabolic alkalosis in someone who has NG tube suctioning, right? A lot of that will remove electrolytes. So if it's removing electrolytes um, from our fluids, right, that's going to cause the electrolytes to go down. If you're vomiting um, or having like a lot of diarrhea or you're taking diuretics, all of that can lower your electrolyte values. So that's why in metabolic alkalosis, you'll see hypokalemia as a result. Um, and metabolic alkalosis will be a pH greater than 7.45 and a bicarbonate greater than 26 because normal bicarbonate is 22 to 26. Whereas for renal failure, right, the problem is that we can't regulate those electrolytes. So they just continue to accumulate. And Potassium especially is excreted in our um, in our urine. About 80% of it is excreted through our urine. So if the kidneys aren't working, we can't excrete potassium and it accumulates. And that's why we get hyperkalemia. Any questions about what I just said? No. Okay. Something else that I want to point out or a trick that helps me when it comes to answering questions with like um, when they give you a bunch of numbers and they ask you to identify um, 
the type of imbalance is I always look at the pH first and that will let me know if it's, you know, acidotic or alkaline, right? If it's greater or lower than that normal range, which the normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. Then I look at the bicarbonate and the CO2. If the bicarbonate is normal, right? Then I know, okay, it's not a metabolic issue. If the CO2 is normal, I know, okay, it's not a respiratory issue. But let's just say all the values weren't normal. The next thing I'm going to look for is that that Rome, right? So I'm going to look for respiratory opposite metabolic equal. So I'm going to be looking for, okay, is the CO2 going up when the pH is going down? Or when the pH is high, is the CO2 going down? Then I know it's a respiratory problem. Even if the meta, uh, if it were like the bicarbonate were out of whack, um, as long as it's not um, the same, meaning it's not decreasing as with the pH, it's not going to be a metabolic issue. But I've never seen them provide a question where the metabolic, um, where it could look like metabolic or respiratory. They're not going to do something where you could kind of see both of them happening at the same time. It's either the bicarbonate's going to change or the car carbon dioxide's going to change, and you'll be able to see that in the values. Um, so um, I don't know if you all want, but I can I can give you a practice example, and and you could tell me what acid base imbalance you think it is if that would be helpful yes please that would be great all right i'm gonna type it into the chat because um i don't want to change the screen so just give me like one second and then somebody could you could type it in or shout out the answer whenever you have it Okay, so I typed it into the chat um, and someone could shout out or type in what they think the answer will be. And I'll tell you if you're right or wrong. Yeah. Okay. So I'm seeing people type in answers. Yeah, it is metabolic alkalosis. And if you're looking at it, right, it's a pH of 7.50. It's a bicarbonate of 30. It's a PaCO2 of 50 and a PaO2 of 90. Now I changed the value purposely for PaCO2 for you to see that if you're looking at that like little mnemonic Rome, this wouldn't work for respiratory, right? Because the CO2 isn't going to raise the same time the pH is going to range. So I already know it's not a respiratory issue, but I see that the bicarbonate raised while the pH raised. So I know it has to be a metabolic issue and it's metabolic alkalosis. Does that help? Yes. yes. Okay. Like I said, you can see all the numbers change and you can have a bunch of them, but that's how I think about it. I'm just looking for that characteristics of Rome. And if I see it, then I know what it is. And all the other numbers that are there are just to trick you, but I don't, don't let it trick you. But okay. Yeah. So we talked about the different imbalances. We talked about what they are um, in terms of what causes them and what the results are. So we're good with that. Okay. So the next question is to identify the sodium level imbalance associated with um, SIADH and provide clinical manifestations and clinical management of it. So um, just to kind of explain what 
SIADH is for those who don't know. It's essentially when the body is making too much antidiuretic hormone. And um, that means that um, they're not peeing because of it. They have so much antidiuretic hormone, antidiuresis, meaning not peeing, that they can't really go to the bathroom. And interestingly, they're going to have a lot of retention of water, right? And we know that if the more water you have, that dilutes sodium, which is why we see an imbalance of hyponatremia in someone who has SIADH. But interestingly, um, when someone who has SIADH, they'll have weight gain, right? because they're having water build up in their body because they can't pee it out. They're gonna have a high concentrated urine because if they pee anything out, it's gonna be a little and it's gonna be very concentrated. And interestingly, um, we have to worry about um, weight gain, but they're not gonna have peripheral edema, okay? So they might have like, um, we might put them on daily weights, but they're not going to have like swelling in their legs and their arms. And this is because um, they actually have help from the kidneys in this situation. And it causes it not to go into the tissue space. Water only builds up in the vascular space. So it builds up where the blood is, where the sodium is, but it doesn't lead into the tissues. That's why if you saw one of the course point questions, right, they'll have fluid retention. They could have um, jugular vein dissension because the fluid is in that vascular space, but it's not in the tissue space. That's why they wouldn't have edema presenting with um, SIADH. I just wanted to point that out there. Um, I see a hand raise. Um, yeah, that's me. I just had a quick question um, about uh what you were just saying um if they're like retaining like water with the siadh wouldn't it be um the urine like more diluted since it's like an accumulation of water and not salt i see what you mean the problem is that they're having water build up but they're not peeing so the urine itself is just sitting in the bladder and it's whatever comes out is still going to be highly concentrated, but they just aren't peeing enough. It would be, it wouldn't really be diluted because the water isn't going into the bladder where the urine is. The water is building up in the vascular space with the blood, not the like bladder itself. So it's kind of like when you have like fluid, fluid volume deficit where they're not peeing because they don't have enough fluid to pee. In this case is they have water retention, but they have too much antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone means that they are, it's antidiuresis, it's anti going to the bathroom. So they're having a hard time peeing. That's why they have the water buildup in that vascular space, but they're not peeing enough. So all that urine just becomes concentrated. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does because if you think about it, the urine has like a lot of waste products in it. So if it's just stuck there, like, yeah, I get it. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, you don't see peripheral edema here just because it's not, it's not fluid leaking into the interstitial space. It's in the intravascular space in the blood vessels itself. It doesn't leak out into the tissues. I just wanted to point it out because, um, I was watching like a video on Archer a long time ago, and that's what they were talking about when it comes to um, SIADH and why it becomes very confusing because it's like, oh, they have water retention, but they don't have edema. And that's because it doesn't leave the interstitial space. The only way you can have edema is if fluid goes into the interstitial space, and that's not what happens here. But like I said, because water is building up in that vascular space, it dilutes sodium, which causes hyponatremia, which is why we have to watch out for seizure precautions for these patients because any sodium imbalance causes um, neurological changes and can potentially lead to a seizure. But um, I did see like different types of questions on course point and whatnot, and they were basically were referring to um, right what sodium level you would see, which would be a decreased sodium level in SIADH.
um, to watch out for cerebral edema, right? Because it's the blood vessels that are getting all that fluid and that can lead to the seizures. Um, and what uh, Professor Remy was talking about, these are just some of the notes that I have from her from um, our overview, um, is that the pathophysiology is that there, there's excess water without sodium because it's diluting it, right? And um, we see why SIDH has um, hyponatremia. So some things that we could do is have strict INOs, daily weights, because daily weights are the best indicator for fluid gains and loss, especially because we know that these patients are going to have weight gain and SIADH because of um, water retention. We really need to watch out for that. Um, as well as we want to increase the sodium intake through uh, sodium chloride tablets. I have in my previous notes, hypertonic solutions um, for replacement. I also saw a course point question like that, where it says you have to give a hypertonic solution to someone who has symptomatic um, hyponatremia. Um, so I'm not really sure with that one, but if I had a question, I would pick that because I've just, that's what I've seen so far. Um, and as well as making sure that we, for these patients, we don't want to give them free tap water or regular water to drink. And that's because regular water, they already have enough water. They're going to continue to retain water in that vascular space. And it's going to continue to lower those sodium levels, which is why we don't want to give them water. We can give them fluid like, you know, normal saline because it has chloride in it and it has sodium in it, but not water, because that's going to make it worse. Is there any questions about that? So when the professor was saying yesterday about giving tap water, that was incorrect. She was saying, I, I think she was saying no free tap water. I thought that's what she said, unless I heard it wrong. But I have in my notes, and as well as some things, like on course point that said no free tap water for someone who has hyponatremia. Okay. Because water will continue to dilute the sodium. Thank you. Okay. And just, um, to, hmm? sorry, just real quick. So for SIADH, we want to look out for um, cerebral edema. Yeah, that's a potential problem that they can get because of the hyponatremia that could lead to the seizures. Um, but they're not going to have peripheral edema. They're not going to have that. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And something else that I saw on course point is that actually um, for lab values, they're going to have a low hematocrit and a low BUN. And that's probably because of all the water buildup um, in the vascular space. I just wanted to point that out. I saw that on a course point question. So I added that into my notes that I didn't have before. But yeah, our goal for this is sodium replacement, seizure precautions, fluid restrictions, right, of regular water, but we want to encourage, right, like um, normal saline. Um, and we got to watch out for INOs and daily weights. Um, okay, so I already went over like SIADH and hyponatremia, like how they're related to each other. Um, I don't know if she's going to ask specifically about hyponatremia, but manifestations that I typically see a lot is always the seizures, potential cerebral edema, abdominal cramping, as well as a dry mucosa and poor skin turgor. Those are like the most common ones, but your priority when it comes to uh, patients who have sodium imbalance is always seizure. That's the problem that we have with these patients. Everything else, yeah, it can be concerning, but the seizures is the priority here. Um, okay, so we already talked about arterial blood gases. We talked about how to interpret them and how to use the value. So I'm not going to go over that again, but as a reminder, she did mention, right, someone who's vomiting, we talked about this, vomiting, NG tube suctioning, and medications like diuretics are typical for someone who um, is a typical uh, problem for someone who has metabolic alkalosis, okay? So that means we're looking for a high pH and a high bicarbonate, okay? So if it says, it doesn't even have to say anything more than 
hey, a patient's on a diuretic, what acid base imbalance could they be at um, risk for? Uh, this patient has um, been vomiting and having diarrhea for the last two days. Um, what imbalance am I looking for? Things like that. And, and I've seen questions like that on course point, very similarly worded um, with all of the imbalances. So if you know what causes, like we talked about before, the causes, then you'll know what lab values you're expected to see. Okay. So the next question is to identify the complication of a client receiving isotonic solutions, clinical manifestations, and nursing management. So regardless, if it, even if it didn't say an isotonic solution, what is a general problem that we see if someone's getting a lot of fluid? Fluid volume overload? Exactly, right? If we're giving them fluid, regardless of the type, if we're giving them so much of it, there's a risk that they could have fluid overload that can cause peripheral edema, that can cause pulmonary edema, it can cause cerebral edema, it can cause swelling and water buildup anywhere. Fluid can go anywhere in the body, right? If we're giving too much. And as a result, we could hear crackles in the lungs. They could have a distended jugular vein. They'll have a high blood pressure because all of that pressure from all that fluid in the body, right? So I think um, I think I did see a question like this on course point, and it was talking about like, oh, you know, someone's getting a lot of fluids. Like, what should they be worried about? What or what should you assess? And it should be lung sounds, right? And and if someone's getting a lot of fluids, your priority should be I should look at lung sounds because they're having fluid buildup and it can go into the lungs and that can affect breathing. And examples of isotonic solutions include 0.9% normal saline, lactated ringers, or 5% dextrose in water. And as uh, Professor Remy would emphasize, the problem with dextrose 5% in water is that it can cause edema through the sugar crystallizing. Is there any questions about this? No. Okay. So the next thing is hypovolemia, right? And clinical manifestations and nursing management. How do we assess a patient who has hypovolemia? Well, hypovolemia is can also be called fluid volume deficit. The terms are interchangeable, but it's not dehydration. Dehydration is just a loss of water, whereas um, hypovolemia is a loss of fluids and water and electrolytes, okay? So we can be losing a lot of things. It's not just water like in dehydration, but it can lead to dehydration, okay? It can go to that. Um, so, if we're talking about the problem is that we're losing body fluids, right? More rapidly than we are able to intake, what could be examples of problems that can cause um, fluid volume deficit? Hemorrhage? Sorry. Mm hmm I heard hemorrhage. What else? Adrenal insufficiency, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, NG suctioning, GI suctioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of those things, um, as well as burns, right? Um, so in hypovolemic shock, right? That's because so much fluid is lost and you see that through hemorrhaging, burns, or accidents. So that's why fluid volume deficit needs to be corrected because we can go into hypovolemic shock. Now, adrenal insufficiency can be related to diabetes insipidus. I just want to point that out because diabetes insipidus means that we have too much diuretic hormone, not too much, sorry, too little of the antidiuretic hormone, which means that... Um, they are peeing a lot. That's why it's called diabetes insipidus because they have like manifestations of like polyuria and things like that you would see in someone who's a diabetic patient, but they pee so much and they remove so much fluids. It's actually an, ad ad an adrenal 
issue. I just wanted to point that out because I didn't really know what diabetes insipidus was for a long time. Um, I learned more about it recently. But yeah, so diabetes insipidus is when you don't have um, enough antidiuretic hormone, which means you pee a lot. Compared to SIADH, the problem is there's too much antidiuretic hormone, so they don't pee at all. But yeah, anything that can cause a loss, right? So we have to watch out for those things. And we want to correct the issue, right? If, if the problem is vomiting and diarrhea, we want to stop them from vomiting and going to the bathroom. If it's GI suctioning, we may need to hold off on that. If it's just not taking enough intake, right? Assess that. Try to give them oral fluids. If it's burns, if it's hemorrhaging, replace it with either blood or fluid. We want to treat whatever the problem is. Now, we know that for our older population, one of the big things is that, um, you know, medications is really hard with them because they need to have reduced dosaging as well as um, their skin trigger is more poor. So it's harder to assess um let's just say if their skin is dry, right? Like something that you might see in fluid volume deficit because of the way that their skin presents with a decreased elasticity. So before I get into the management of fluid volume deficit, I want to talk about the manifestations because I think if you know the manifestations, you know how to treat the patient. So for example, hypovolemia, we typically see tachypnea, and what kind of pulse would you typically see for someone who has fluid volume deficit? Rapid thready pulse. Yeah, that's because they don't have as much fluid. So how can the pulse, you know, do its thing um, the way it's supposed to if we are lacking in fluids, right? Uh, tachycardia, but with a weak rapid thready pulse, okay, it's going to be weak. Um, we're going to have weight loss, right? Because they're losing fluid. They don't have as much fluid, right? The membranes are going to be dry because they don't have as much fluid. They're going to have a lower blood pressure because they don't have as much fluid. The skin's going to be more cool. They're going to be weak and tired, confused, as well as having a delayed capillary refill which means greater than three seconds, as well as um, they'll have a flattened JV, um, oliguria, and the CVP decreases, which is also known as central venous pressure, which makes sense, right? Because if they don't have enough fluid, how can the central venous pressure increase when there's not enough circulating um, volume to go around in their body? It's going to decrease. Um, and... Something else that I wanted to point out is that the lab values in fluid volume deficit increase. So we see hematocrit increasing, hemoglobin increasing, BUN increasing, and urine-specific gravity increasing as a result of um, not really peeing. So whatever they pee out is going to be really concentrated. So... If these are the symptoms for fluid volume deficit, how would we manage them? What are some things that you would think of to help manage the patient based on these symptoms? Give them IV fluids, like isotonic. Mm -hmm. What else? we should look at vital signs, right? Because the pulse is going to be abnormal as well as the blood pressure. We should look at labs because we notice that there'll be an increase in particular labs that we should look out for, right? We should do assessments of the skin and the mucous membranes because they're gonna be more dry, right? If they're gonna be confused, we should look at their mental status. If they're going to have weight loss, we need to do daily weights, right? If the problem is that they're not having enough fluid, we need strict INOs. So we make sure that they're getting the fluid replacements that they need and they're outputting the proper amount of fluid, 
right? Um, as well as, you know, looking at um, fall precautions because they have a risk for orthostatic hypotension and low blood pressures in general can make you dizzy. So we really have to watch out for that. So like the reason I was trying to start with the manifestations is I think it really helps with trying to understand what you need to do for your patient, right? So strict eye and nose, looking at pulses, looking at urine output, right? Why would I need to do that? Well, the pulse is going to be off. Their urine output is going to be decreased. So I need to assess that. I need to look at daily weights because they're going to be losing weight, vitals, mental status, labs, fluid replacement. Someone said isotonic solutions, right? Because we need to increase that circulating volume, skin assessments, and fall precautions, okay? And something else that I like to add is that if you know fluid volume deficit, you know fluid volume excess because it's the complete opposite. So if you have tachypnea and fluid volume deficit, you have... Um, bradypenia and crackles and coughing because of that accumulation of fluid. Instead of having a weak pulse, you have a bounding pulse in hypervolemia, um, but they both can cause tachycardia. Um, fluid volume deficit has weight loss, but you have weight gain in hypervolemia because of that increase in fluid in the body. You'll have edema in fluid volume excess, but you won't have that in fluid volume deficit. Lab values decrease, like the ones we've mentioned already, compared to increasing. That central venous pressure is going to increase in fluid volume excess because they have more circulating fluid, as well as a descended JV and a high blood pressure, which is different or the opposite of fluid volume deficit because it'll be flattened and it'll be a low blood pressure. So I feel like if you know one, you automatically know the other. And obviously, if this is fluid volume excess, the different the thing that's going to be different in terms of management is going to be fluid restrictions, not fluid replacement. So I hope that helps with understanding as well as just knowing that in um, Dr. Remy's slides, it said that the three signs of uh, fluid volume deficit that would be indica indicative of later or worsening signs would be oliguria, the flattened JV, and the CVP decreasing. Is there any questions on that stuff? No. Could you just repeat the weight signs again? Say that again? Oh, wait, just go down. The weight signs of fluid volume deficit. I just wanted to see them. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, those are the three signs. They're on the, the slides too for uh, fluid volume deficit. She like put them on the bottom somewhere. Um, I just wanted to mention that. Alicia, I wanted to ask you, mm. hypovolemia, you, you mentioned um, cool skin, but also clammy hands as well? Yeah. Cool, clammy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So the next thing, I think this goes into shock, but the way she did it in the outline, it didn't look like that, but it seems like we're in shock. So. Um, the next question is to identify clinical manifestations of hypovolemic shock, um, as well as the nursing actions. So this, when I think about this question, um, we already talked about fluid volume deficit. So I think it's a perfect transition into this. And this is when, right, we don't have enough volume, right? There's so much loss of fluid that, um, now they're going into a state of shock. So, we talked about, right, abnormal fluid losses can be hemorrhaging, burns, accidents, things like that, okay? So the manifestations are very closely related to fluid volume deficit, right? Pallor, because of now in shock, they've gotten to the point where they have decreased cardiac output. They have cool, you know, skin. Um, they have tachypnea. They have a rapid, weak, thready pulse. Um, they'll have a low blood pressure and concentrated urine, okay? So if we're looking at all of these signs and symptoms, we're seeing that they're very similar to um, fluid volume deficit because this is just a more worsened result of fluid volume deficit. So we already know the things that we sort of, we need to do, right? Look at vitals, look at labs, right? But in this case, since they're in shock and the problem is that 
they're having lack of perfusion, which means they're also having a lack of oxygen. We're going to want to add oxygen to the list, right? As well as giving fluids, assessing mental status changes, um, assessing urination, um, making sure if it's a blood loss, we give a blood transfusion and things like that. And the lab values are going to increase, just like in fluid volume deficit. We're going to have an increased urine-specific gravity, increased hematocrit, increased hemoglobin. Um, I just wanted to point all that out. Also, I see this is wrong. I'm just going to put clammy. I don't know why I put that. But it should be cool and clammy skin. But that's the same exact manifestations as fluid volume deficit. So you don't have to memorize different types of symptoms, but you know that if you have fluid volume deficit, you're at risk to going into hypovolemic shock. Okay. So what I also saw that I wanted to mention is that um, what we could do or some management could be modif doing a modified Trendelberg. That's what I saw on course point. It said that for hypovolemic shock, the best position is modified Trendelberg. I'm not sure how that's different than the other one, but this is what course point said. So I just wanted to point that out as well as right. Um, if we're thinking about a priority of what to do for these patients, if, since they're in shock, regardless of the type, our priority is going to be oxygen. Now, if this were, anaphylactic shock and there was a choice of epinephrine, I would pick epinephrine first before oxygen because the airway is going to start to close regardless of the oxygen coming in. They're not going to be able to take it. So other than that, all the types of shock, if you see an answer that says put oxygen from what I've seen, regardless of the type, that seems to be the answer. Okay. So the next thing is defining the pathophysiology of shock and identifying the types of shock and nursing management of ease. Now, someone can correct me, but Dr. Remy said that shock is basically when we have circulatory collapse leading to hypoperfusion and hypoxia, meaning we're having hypoperfusion in the blood and we're having hypoxia, which is lack of O2 to the tissues. Now, what I did notice based on doing questions and, you know, um, going through my notes is that when we initially have shock, like the initial early stage of shock, we will see an increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, increased blood pressure, right? We're going to have all of these responses going on, um, as well as having a decreased urine output. Those are the things that I noticed is what happens as well as confusion, right? Confusion, uh, decrease your output, that cool can't, clammy skin, all of that happens initially, but with an increased blood pressure and an increased heart rate, and increased respiratory rate to begin with in that initial stage. Does anybody have anything different than that? That's the way I understand it based on um when we initially experience shock. Those are the things we will see before our body tries to compensate. Um, I have a question because I thought in the compensatory like stage of shock, the body is still able to like maintain the blood pressure and the cardiac output. So everything, including like the vital signs will remain normal. But according to what you're saying is that like the heart rate and the respiratory rate, everything will be increased. So which one is it? Because I'm kind of confused on that. So when they're initially in shock, everything increases, like heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure. This is not compensatory. This is just initial shock, like when their body enters that early stage. Because it takes a little while for the body's compensatory mechanisms to kick in. It's not going to kick in automatically. Um, for example, right, in compensatory, the heart rate is high, the respiratory rate is high, but as you said, the blood pressure and cardiac output is normal. Yes, it is normal and compensatory, and we still have decreased urine output, cool, clammy skin, and you know, confusion, but the blood pressure and cardiac output is normal and when it reaches the compensatory stage. But that initial shock or the earliest stage before compensatory, we have an increased heart rate, increased respiratory rate, increased blood pressure. Okay, I understand. Because I thought that it just goes straight into compensatory. I didn't know that there was like something before that, but now I do. 
I know what you mean. I was confused too, but when I was doing questions, they were saying there was initial shock, like what happens in that early stage before you hit into compensatory. And um, I was noticing that it was mentioning this, but in the course point, I didn't see as much. I just wanted to like emphasize that initially that's what's going to happen before your body kicks in the compensatory stage. It's just that initial, everything's going to go a little crazy. Um, and then when your body's compensating for it, the blood pressure and cardiac output's going to be normal. And when you see questions like on course point, you're going to see what stage are they in. You're going to see when the blood pressure is normal, you know, they're in that compensatory stage. The same way that, um, right, it's kind of like when you hemorrhage, right? Your body has compensatory mechanisms to try, right, tachycardia, but the blood pressure is still going to keep dropping until we can, you know, stop the bleeding. It's kind of like something like that. Um, but for all types of shock, regardless, we have to figure out what is causing that shock, whatever it is. We want to treat that, identify and treat. I saw a question like that on Course Point where it was asking, what do you do? And I think that might be one of the, like, types of questions she might be looking for is what should you do if someone has shock? I mean, to first figure out what's going on and treat the type of shock that they have. So um, I also wanted to point out that if we're trying to treat the cause, we know that shock in general is causing lack of perfusion and a decreased O2. So our priority is going to be giving them oxygen in some way, shape or form. We also could call a rapid response team, right? We could also give them epinephrine, norepinephrine, depending on the circumstance, right? Especially if it's cardiogenic shock, epinephrine, norepinephrine might be good. But regardless, oxygen is our priority. We need circulating O2 to get good perfusion to the tissue so organs don't fail. And we could do fluid replacements. We need to also do that so we could restore that intravascular volume through those isotonic fluids like normal saline. Um, and we also want to give nutritional support, either through enteral or paternal, not oral, when it comes to shock, okay? Because they're also confused, right? So you're not going to try to feed someone who's confused. So we already talked about the stages of shock, but I want to point out some things that I keep seeing. So when I keep seeing and I'm doing practice questions, they keep emphasizing that for compensatory, we're looking for normal blood pressure, normal cardiac output tachycardia, tachypnea, decreased urine output, confusion, and respiratory alkalosis. Those are the things that I keep seeing coming up, coming up when they ask about manifestations of compensatory, okay? I just want to point that, I want to put that in your mind so you know. The next thing is for um, progressive shock. It's worse. This means that the compensatory mechanisms fail. So that instead of that blood pressure and cardiac output being normal, the blood pressure drops, okay? And things that I'm seeing that are characteristic manifestations of progressive shock are rapid and shallow respirations, a low blood pressure, but still a high heart rate, crackles because now the, the lungs begin to fail because of that per continued decreased perfusion to the lungs. We also have an even worsened mental status. So altered mental status is continuing, as well as potential abnormal bruising and clotting. And one question that I saw that was like, which stage is this person in? All it said was a low blood pressure, like it had a number for a low blood pressure, a higher heart rate, like above 100. It said shallow respiration and molted skin. Okay, so I just want you to know, like these very typical manifestations that represent in these stages. Okay. And for irreversible shock, everything's failed at this point. And we could even have organ damage and go into organ failure. But the BP is still going to be low. But what separates this from progressive is that we could have multiple organ dysfunction, worsened or profound acidosis. If you see something like that on a question, that relates to irreversible. As well as if it says that this patient needs mechanical ventilation, that's indicative for irreversible shock. Because now it's so bad that they can't even breathe on their own. Any questions about that? I have a question, Alicia. So in mm. the compensatory um, stage, right, is, are they gonna have cold and clammy? Because I was looking at other resources outside 
And they were saying in progressive, you would see cold and clammy skin, which would make sense too. I don't know which one is right because in the textbook, it says cold and clammy for compensatory, but like sources like simple nursing and, you know, reliable sources online, they're saying like progressive. So which one is it? I'll be honest, if I saw a question, I would still pick cold and um, clammy skin just because they're in shock. Even though compensatory, it's still there. It's still their their body is still, you know, having a lack of perfusion. So I would still pick it. Okay. I would still pick it for both of them because cold and clammy is really indicative of your not getting adequate perfusion. So regardless if it's compensatory or progressive, it's going to be cold and clammy. At one point, how the hell is it going to go back to pink and moist type of a skin if you see it that way? Yeah, I, I if it's a select all, I haven't seen one like that, I would pick it. It just, it doesn't hurt. And you could argue that 0.10 of a point on the exam because it is in our textbook. And since it's there, I would pick it because it's still, as you know, Safin has said, it's a lack of perfusion. So that's a manifestation of it. Um, and yeah. Okay. So we also have um, classifications for shock. So I'm not going to keep going into the manifestations because I don't want it to like drain. I want to get like the main points. But this is what Dr. Remy said. We we Our priority is identifying the cause and type and making sure we have an IV access because we need to make sure that we can give medications through IV, right? So for hypovolemic, right, we already said this is a loss of volume, right? Because she said um, patterns of shock can either be, right, volume or distributed. It could be a loss of fluid or it could be a problem where we have vasodilation, okay? Hypovolemic is a volume problem, which we've already talked about a lot. And we could see this in you. Three common instances are burns, hemorrhage, and accidents. It doesn't even have to say accident. If it says a motor vehicle accident, someone came in with a gunshot wound, think um, hypovolemic shock. Cardiogenic means there's something wrong with the heart. Okay, the heart can't do its thing. So think about left side heart failure, something of that sort. And, um, and the only thing I don't know if it's a type of distributive shock, I don't know if it's its own category I think it's its own but um someone can correct me on that I'm not I'm not too sure but I, I know cardiogenic is a type of shock I just don't know if it's considered distributive or not um but I know the ones that Dr. Remy said in terms to know for distributed are septic anaphylactic and neurogenic and those are the ones I'm going to be knowing for distributive so when we're thinking septic we're thinking a bacteria or a capillary leak. Remember, bacteria. And I want you to think septic infection because I'll get to why. For anaphylactic, it's also distributed because they cause vasodilation. So for anaphylactic, our priority is giving epinephrine. And other things that she said that we can do is making sure we teach patients to avoid triggers, to how to inject epinephrine and having an alert bracelet. Our priority is airway here, and that's why we need to give them epinephrine so we can open the airways. And if they have hives and swelling, right, that's indicative of anaphylactic shock, especially swelling in the face area. Neurogenic is a type of distributive shock. Always think of spinal problems, okay? Like something to do with the spine, like spinal cord injuries, as well as potential drug overdoses. But um, I'm, I think cardiogenic is its own thing. So I'm just going to ignore that. I don't know where I saw that from. But just no distributive means vasodilation, and we're talking about septic, anaphylactic, and neurogenic. I think in her review, she did say it was distributive. I thought so. I don't know. I thought I heard that somewhere, but and then I'm, and then I'm seeing on course point it's different. So I'm I don't I'm gonna I feel like I'm gonna get confused. But since I know for sure septic, anaphylactic, and neurogenic are distributive, I think I'm just gonna go by that. I think it's uh distributive for one reason. If it's not corrected the outcome results is the DIC. System for, cardio, for cardiogenic? Yeah. Because hmm. what's the point? What's what's the reason for cardiogenic shock? You have a left heart fail left heart ventricular failure. So if you can't pump blood systemically to go everywhere where you need that tissue perfusion, it's 
and so you're not getting red blood cells, you're not getting white blood cells, you're not getting platelets, you're not getting oxygen, that's first and foremost. Eventually what's gonna happen is you're gonna start getting, blood is gonna end up getting caught it. So that is the outcome of having um, a DIC. Mm. I can see but what you mean. It, it, it could be something we can ask her first thing on Thursday. Yeah, because I the textbook sound says they're different. It's they said it's hypovolemic, cardiogenic, and distributive and obstructive. They're they're saying that cardiogenic is separate, but I think the reason is that it doesn't cause vasodilation. Distributive means that it causes vasodilation, and cardiogenic means that there's an impairment or the failure of the heart muscle to pump, and that's why they go into shock. And that's not as a, that's not due to vasodilation. Mm -hmm. So that's why I don't know, but. I did see somewhere on course point it said it was separate. So I was I was a little confused by that, but um I've I've never seen a question where they asked to like identify them. So I, I would I would not like get too crazy with it. I would just definitely know that septic, anaphylactic, and neurogenic are distributive. Um but yeah, since we're talking about cardiogenic, I just want to emphasize that we need to give oxygen. That's the priority treatment for cardiogenic because of the fact that they're having um, decreased cardiac output because the heart can't pump blood to the rest of the body, which means it's not there's not enough oxygen circulating in the body. So we need to prioritize that. For pharmacologic therapies, we're looking at dobutamine, nitroglycerin, dopamine, and epinephrine or norepinephrine. Now dopamine, I, uh, not dopamine, dobutamine, I saw on course point saying that its purpose is to increase um, cardiac output. Um, both dobutamine and dopamine are going to increase blood pressure. Nitroglycerin, she said it's only used to help with pain, chest pain related to the lack of perfusion. And, um, but the problem is that it can cause a decreased blood pressure. I see hands raised. Oh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask because... I thought she said in the lecture that um, nitroglycerin would not be used for um, treatment since it further vasodilates the blood vessel, which is the problem that's going on in the first place. I, I have in my notes, she said you only use it if they have chest pain. That's all I have. Terms, I'm saying in terms of shock, that wouldn't be like the typical medication that you would give. No, it would just be a situation if they have pain. Okay. I It's not like a go-to med. Yeah, you're right. Like, it's not a go-to med. But I did have in my notes, she said, the only time you're using nitroglycerin is if they have chest pain. But the main medications for cardiogenic uh, shock would be either epinephrine, dobutamine, or dopamine. Okay. So... Now we have distributed, right? We're talking about a problem with the vascular tone, which is causing vasodilation. And I want you to know for that distributive, something that you, you'll see that's gonna let you know in a question that it's distributed is it says warm and flushed skin. That's because when your skin vasodilates or the blood vessels open, your skin's gonna become warm and flushed, right? Like when you work out, that's why, or you're running, or you're doing something very extraneous, your skin turns red and that's because of vasodilation. So you will typically see that in someone who has distributive shock. So remember how I was mentioning also when it comes to shock that there's like an initial and there's a compensatory. For example, in septic shock, right, when we're talking about an infection, in the initial stage, we're going to see a bounding pulse with an increased temperature and heart rate and warm flush skin. But typically, right, after that, because we're talking about vasodilation, you would typically see a low heart rate and a low blood pressure. But because if we're talking about the initial stage of septic shock, we're talking about a bounding pulse, increased temperature, increased heart rate, and a warm flush skin, okay? Something that would let also let you know it's septic is if you see an increased temperature, as well as a warm and flushed skin. Because after that initial stage, it will get into a low blood pressure. So we're not gonna typically see that in someone who has an initial um, 
is in an initial state of septic shock. And I remember seeing a practice question like that on course point, And it was like the blood pressure was normal. They had a temperature, they were warm and flush and they had an increased heart rate. What type of um, shock were they in? They gave septic, they gave neurogenic and they gave anaphylactic. And they said it was septic because in the initial stage, you're gonna see things raise such as the heart rate, the temperature and having warm flush skin as well as a bounding pulse compared to if this were worsening and in a later stage, they'll have a low blood pressure and low heart rate because of the vasodilation. Similarly, talking about vasodilation, right, neurogenic, we're seeing this as a problem with something with the spine, like severe, severe trauma. This is going to cause typically hypotension and bradycardia from that vasodilation. Those are characteristic for that. I also saw on a course point question recently that dry skin is also very characteristic for neurogenic. Um, and we know anaphylactic is an allergic reaction, which is causing vasodilation, and that we want to give epinephrine. Okay, so I already talked about cardiogenic. Like I said, focus is oxygen. I just want to put that out there. Okay, we talked about progressive shock. We talked about that we'll see a low blood pressure in this. And other things that we'll see is rapid shallow respirations, decreased mental status, high heart rate, abnormal bruising and clotting, as well as crackles, okay? Those are very characteristic for progressive, as well as molted skin. For compensatory, right, it'll be normal blood pressure, normal cardiac output, tachycardia, tachypnea, decreased urine output, confusion, respiratory alkalosis. And we said just, I would, I will pick, if I see cool and clammy skin for all of these stages, I will pick them. Like if it's talking about compensatory, progressive, or irreversible, if we were to ask to pick the manifestations, I will pick cool and clammy because it relates to that lack of perfusion, okay? And we said for irreversible, if we see mechanical ventilation or worsened acidosis in the question, we know that that relates to irreversible shock. Now, as I said, we already talked about neurogenic, that it relates to vasodilation. That's why we'll typically see low heart rate, low blood pressure, warm and flushed skin, dry skin, and a decreased urine output. But a question that I saw recently on Course Point, it just provided low blood pressure, bradycardia, and dry skin. And that was indicative of neurogenic because of the vasodilation. Okay. So now I think... When she's saying identify clinical manifestations of a client experiencing shock, she means if she gives you a situation, what to do. You know what I mean? Like how to identify what type of shock you're in. And that's why I think she was giving examples like, oh, if you have a low blood pressure, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, we're looking at maybe progressive shock. If we're talking about low heart rate, low BP, dry skin and warm flush skin, we're looking at neurogenic. So I think she wants you to have you know, if she gives you an example or some data, how to identify. That's why I tried to give you examples. And you'll see more if you do more practice questions through course point. And like I said, general management, even though we have a bunch of different things we could do, like epinephrine, rapid response, Foley's, fluid replacements, vasoactive medications, oxygen is our priority. Okay. So, um, and we talked about early stage of shock, you see? how we were talking about what's the difference. So in early stages, right, we're looking at increased heart rate, right? Increased respiratory, increased blood pressure, increased cardiac output, confusion, cool, clammy, and decreased urine output. That's something that we see initially, okay? It, but it all depends also, right, on the type of shock they're in. But if it were to ask just generally, if all oh, this patient's in early shock, you know, in an early stage shock, what would you expect to see? I would expect all of those vital signs to increase as well as there be confusion, cool, clammy skin, and decrease urine output. That's what I would pick. Okay. So, is there any questions on that? Sorry, the dry skin was for neurogenic? Or so yes. Mm-hmm. Neurogenic. Okay. I saw that somewhere on a course point question. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, all right. Now, the next thing is management of patients with um, oncologic disorders. So the first question is to provide potential clinical manifestation of a client receiving chemotherapy agent and perform the um, nursing assessment based on the findings. 
So um, the way I kind of thought about this is if she gives us like a symptom, because she was saying, oh, let's just say someone has a risk for bleeding or they have thrombocytopenia. Like, what do we do? What do we look for? Um, such as if they have thrombocytopenia, and that's a problem we're looking for, like ecchymosis and petechiae, right? Um, we're looking at, you know, their CBC. If it's, um, if they said they have bone marrow suppression, then we expect them to have lower, you know, values such as, you know, RBCs, WBCs, and platelets. Um, they're going to have fatigue and poor nutrition, right? So we want to assess their nutritional status and things like that. And then we want to attempt to give them, you know, fluids and give them the nutri nutrients that we they need, right? We have to have infection prevention precautions because they have, they are at risk for neutropenia. So we need to have neutropenia precautions, which is limiting visitors and um, making sure you have no fresh flowers in the room or that they don't have fresh fruits and vegetables, right? Um, we also look that they could have stomitis, which is like an oral infection, right? They can get like red ulcerations in the mouth. So we need to also teach them about mouth care that um, they could also expect to experience nausea and vomiting. So we want to help them um, reduce those symptoms. Um, they could have hair loss or um, alopecia, okay, as well as dry or wet discrimination. So dry is like scaly, dry, itchy, slaw like, um, you know, skin texture, as well as they could have blisters or wet discriminations. Um, that's how I understood this question. Is there anything else anybody had to add or they wanted to add for this particular question? No. Okay. I think, yeah, I think it's going to be um, what like manifestations you might get from someone who's like, you know, receiving this. Um, okay. The next thing is knowing the class and indication of uh, vincristine therapy and the adverse reaction. So I heard her emphasize extravasation where like they could have warmth, redness, you know, necrotic tissue at the IV site. And she was, I heard the end, her saying the antidote was dimethyl sulfoxide. I don't know if anyone else heard that. I don't know if I heard that correctly, but that's what I heard. Um, it's correct. Okay. Cause I didn't know if I heard it right, but um, okay. That's good. But I know um, when I was doing research is that vincristine belongs to these vinca alkaloids. That's its class. And what this class does is that it impedes the proper division of cancer cells. So it helps prevent the cancer cells from growing. And you typically see this being used in cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, neuroblastoma, Will's tumor. Regardless, we know it's a, you know, a chemotherapy agent. We know it helps with different types of cancers, right? We know the type of class and the adverse effects that I was seeing or a predominant one is neurotoxicity. So it can cause peripheral peripheral neuropathy so it can cause numbness tingling and pain in like um you know the hands and the feet especially as well as like cns depression i saw there could be hair loss when you take this medication as well as gi toxicity so they can have gi problems like constipation and a big problem that can occur when taking this medication is extravasation which which is something dr remy mentioned uh, the other day. Is there anything else anybody would want to add to this? All right, I take silence as no. So I guess that's a good thing. Um, okay, so the next question is to identify and differentiate types of cancer cells. So I think the question is going to be based on the difference between malignant and benign cancer cells. So honestly, like the way I think about this question is that, you know, um, Dr. Remy was mentioning malignant also means that the cells are metastasizing. So it's growing very rapidly and we want to look at how much it spreads. That's why we do the, um, the TNM, right? So we could see the growth and size of the tumor. So malignant always think things spreading really quickly, things spreading to other places, right? Um, invading like healthy host cells, things like that. 
Whereas benign, they're not cancerous cells. They have a slower growth. They have differentiated cells, which is good. And, but a problem that it can cause is that, you know, even though it's not a cancerous um, issue, it can cause pressure against normal tissues if it gets so big. And something I also want to mention is Dr. Ami said in class about carcinoma in stew, which is basically stage zero of cancer, where um, there's an abnormal group of cells in the body, but um, they're not really doing anything. Does, is there anything anybody would want to add for that? So in situ means um, staying located in one location, not spreading. That's exactly. What... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not moving. There's something abnormal there, but it's not really much of a concern. And that kind of goes into the next thing. Um, identify components that indicate the progressive extent of malignant cancer. And she mentioned this, uh, TNM. And I think the question might have to relate to like, if you see a question on like the T0, N0, like what does that mean sort of thing. And I've seen a few questions like that on course point, but TNM means either T stands for the presence or absence of a tumor. The N is the presence or absence of lymph node metastasis. And the M is for um, distant metastasis, presence or absence of that. Um, so I did see a few questions on that. And I actually have this little chart over here where it just summarizes um, what it means. So if you see any of these with a zero, that means that there was either no presence of a tumor, no regional lymph node metastasis, no distant metastasis. If you see numbers next to it, that means it's increasing in either its size or its movement, right? Because N and M would be metastasized of some in some way, and the T has to do with the size of the tumor. And if you see TIS, that means the carcinoma is in stew. Okay, I once mentioned that because I did see a question like that on course point, and it said TIS. Okay. So I think it might be a question relating to how to figure out if she gave you one, what that means. So, um, okay. Now there's only two questions left. So she also gave us teaching for iodine-131, which is oral radiation therapy. And um, basically she said that thyroid cancer, if you give iodine-131, it's considered external radiation. It is unsealed, right? Um, it stays in the body for 48 to 72 hours after discharge. You can't see anybody for two weeks. You sleep alone for two weeks and you flush the toilet bowl three times a day. Does anybody else have anything to add for that? I had a question. What does unsealed mean? And sealed? I think unsealed means you can drink it and sealed means it's not. If, unless somebody has a different meaning. Thank you. If you drink it, wouldn't it be considered internal if it's going into your body? Honestly, I'm not understanding the difference. She just said internal radiation means intracavity or interstitial. And if it's not given through any of those means, it's considered external. That's all I have in baseline of information in terms of that I don't really know the difference. If someone else has something to add, they can. She said it's unsealed, even though you're drinking it. Okay. But yeah, I think she just said she just wanted to know patient teaching, which she told us the 48 to 72 hours, stay away from people for two weeks and flush the toilet bowl a few times. I would love to know why we have to flush the toilet bowl, but... Um, if anyone knows why, definitely, um, let me know. Uh, just the common sense, the, um, are you, are you the sure? inside the urine, see if you flush once, the next person who's going to use the toilet, there is a likely chance there will be cross-contamination and the person will be exposed to it. So flushing three times is like a due diligence of an actual flush um i don't know why she really highlighted it in that way but that's how i can think of it you flush because um like for people who have pets and kids 
because little kids will go into the toilet bowl, they could drink the water, and the pets could also drink the water. So they, they recommend that you flush the toilet two or three times. Okay. That makes sense. I just didn't, she didn't really explain it. So um, I was wondering why um, she mentioned that in class, but thank you for that. Um, okay. So the last thing that I have is um, for mitomycin. And basically what I have for that is that she said it was an anti-neoplastic antibiotic, which means it's an anti-tumor um, it could also mean anti-tumor antibiotic. And she said the mechanism of action is that it binds to DNA. And when it binds to that DNA, it prevents the synthesis and function of those um, cancer cells. So she wants to know the side effects, the adverse effects, and patient education. Um, I remember she was talking in class about the um, side effects when she was talking about anti-neoplastic um drugs. So she was saying like poor nutrition, hexia, um, anemia, neutropenia, uh, thrombocytopenia, infections, immunosuppressions, the mites, like all the stuff that we were saying before. And as well as I saw that an adverse effect for uh, mitomycin is that it can cause extravasation or um, redness at the site. And um, that's not good. So um, I was thinking that for this, the question might be an adverse effect would be like the redness, as well as things that I saw, because I also wrote down in my notes that for nursing management, it was, um, she was talking about how to handle chemotherapeutic agents. And it was to uh, wear surgical gloves and protective clothing and dispose of waste in a double red bag. I also have for nursing management, I, I got this from course point is that for IV administration of anti-neoplastics that we need to um, monitor it because we want to watch out for tissue necrosis, as well as I thought of um, neutropenic precautions and monitoring for like the TKA and ecchymosis, like if they have thrombocytopenia, but that's all I have for minimizing. I don't have anything else. Unless someone else has something to add, that's all I have for this. No? Okay, then I think that's it.